I know you all, you're all fired up on the break. So if you love, if you love the Army Mad Scientist team, because you're on it, I hope you do love it, um, you want to connect to past content. And why, does this, why is this related to our next presenter? Because the way this works is, is we're connected every day to bright people who are thinking about things maybe the Army's not hearing all the time. And that's how we came across Dr. Giardina. Uh, I can't say his name. Dr. G, he's allowed me to do that. So Dr. G, uh, uh, Jamie Canton, Dr. Jamie Canton, who's a, a futurist from California, gave a great presentation at our Georgia Tech conference. You can go on to our YouTube channel, Che.G2 YouTube channel. I really encourage you to listen to that hour presentation uh, by uh, Dr. Canton and, uh, and listen to what he's saying about the future. But Dr. Canton and Mr. Hondo Gertz, who was here yesterday, uh, who has a team called Softworks, uh, and Major Jennifer Snow is an Air Force officer, said, you have to have Dr. G come talk to your, uh, your community of action. So that's how we were connected to him. So if you're interested in uh, Jennifer Snow, Major Jennifer Snow and Dr. Canton, besides just watching the video on the YouTube channel, you can go to the Modern War Institute uh, out of West Point, Captain John Amble back here in the back, who's one of our teammates as a reservist, but uh, runs all the social media out of that uh, team out of West Point, uh, published a podcast several months ago where we took Dr. Canton and uh, Jennifer Snow and basically did about a 45-minute podcast on AI autonomy and the future of warfare. It's phenomenal. You can listen to it on your commute tomorrow. Just go to the Modern War Institute page, go to their podcast, scroll down past the last few, and you can, uh, you can take a listen to that, and I think it'll give you some great ideas. So they connected us to Dr. G, and today um, we get to hear his presentation. He is the Chief of Neuroethics Program here at Georgetown University, and uh, we're looking forward to your presentation, sir. Now save the applause for the end, this way the performance pressure isn't too great. And if you don't applaud at the end, I'll realize that I, I didn't earn my keep. Thank you very much for having me here. I've been working with this community for about the past 10 to 15 years. Uh, as for my wonderful introduction, I am a Georgetown faculty member. I'm chief of the Neuroethics Studies program and hold a, a professorship in both the Department of Neurology as well as the Department of Biochemistry. My particular set of interests have been in the development of advancing areas of neuroscience and neurotechnology with particular deep dive with regard to neurotech. Neurotech has been one of those things that has been sort of outside of the radar of the biological toxins and weapons conventions and also the chemical weapons conventions until quite recently when at the last RevCon, the Australia group sort of pitched up and said, you know, you probably need to consider this biological thing a little more broadly and conceive it in terms that are a bit more relevant. Working with someone who I'm sure is familiar to this group, my colleague, Dr. Diane Deulis, now at the National Defense University, and together with Dan Gerstein, who's out at RAND, what we recognize is, yeah, there's, there's an, a vacancy, there is a gap. Some of the work that I'm going to talk to you about here today has grown out of our past 10 to 15 years effort looking at neuroscience and technology more broadly, and specifically over the past 10 years effort, specifically looking at its applications in neuro, neuroscience and neurotech and national security, intelligence and defense here in the States in terms of what we can do. But also the, the bait that I want to throw out is if we can do it, what makes us think that anybody else can't? And increasingly the point I want to drive home is they can. And in some cases they can do it a lot better than we can for a variety of reasons. Some of them technical, very often them being ethical, legal, social issues that then open up a whole range of possibilities and create a much broader palette of opportunity than we may have here in the States. How will we approach that? What will we do about that? Well, we have a panel subsequent to this that deals with ethical legal issues with regard to biotechnologies and specifically how they're used in the military and operational sphere. But what I'll try to do is at least raise the specter of your suspicion and perhaps of your awareness of what not only is capable right now, but also what may be possible and very probable within the next five to 10 years as a horizon of possibility and what are the ethical, legal, and social issues that need to be addressed? And certainly that sets the stage for the panel. Out of disclosure, some of the work that I'm doing here today is funded by the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories. I'm also funded by the European Union Human Brain Project, specifically the Subproject 12, where I'm a task leader for dual-use brain science. And I've also done some ongoing work with the Strategic Multi-Level Assessment Crew over the past 10 years at the Pentagon, at Dr. Kabayan's group, and with DARPA. Nothing I'm saying here today is wholly representative of any one of those organizations and does not necessarily reflect their opinions or views, but in some cases is strongly aligned with same as I've been contributory to some of those perspectives. That said, Neuroscience and neurotechnology has made ardent leaps over the past 50 years. I already run the cameraman that I can't stay in one place for too long. It's not the coffee, it's just my makeup. 
But as you can see, I don't interfere with the screen. This is called below the radar. It's a height thing. Also, I'd like to apologize for two things in advance. I do neuroscience and technology for a living. I may slip into jargon. I'll try not to. But for those of you who are born in this country and you're trying to figure out what country I come from, this is a New York City accent. I've been out of the city for a long time, but this is about as good as it gets. I spent half of my time in Bavaria. I was talking to my German colleague. He understood me a lot better than one of my colleagues from the American South. So that just should predispose you to what's going on here. I apologize for both of those things in advance. What I don't apologize for is the fact that we may be falling behind in our awareness of neuroscience and technology and its capability in the operation of military and warfare sphere. I think we're coming up to speed somewhat on that, but we are at least one click behind a number of other countries who have made substantive investment in direct use neuroscience and technology for military and national security agenda. We, the United States, and our Western allies very often see this in a dual use framework. That's not to say that we don't have direct use involvement. However, there are other nations that more seamlessly integrate academic, governmental and commercial interests, and may be able to, as a consequence, infiltrate each one of these silos more seamlessly. The ethics that go along with that I'll address briefly, but once again, I'll defer to the panel we have this afternoon that I think will do a wonderful job dealing with some of the ethical issues and at least questions that they rise. But let me just illustrate this for you with a slide in terms of the ardent leaps that neuroscience and technology have made. The field of neuroscience, per se, titularly, has been around for 14 to 40 years. Over the past 14 to 20 years, it has made ardent leaps, harnessing other areas of science and technology in a concentrated agenda called advanced scientific integrative technologies or convergences. The idea of integrative scientific convergence brings together a whole host of capability under a broad rubric of brain science. So if we're talking about bioscience and technology, pharmacology, engineering, genetics, this all falls within the rubric of an integrated neuroscience again, being realized over the past 14 to 20 years. The field of neuroscience, 40 years old. I got into the field when it was still nascent, some 38 years ago. At that time, there were four programs in neuroscience, titularly named. Today, well over 200, just in the United States. The reason I tell you that is to illustrate to you the momentum of the field with regard to its growth. If we go from four titular programs to over 200, not mentioning independent think tanks and freestanding institutes, what that essentially represents is a juggernaut of investment, both financial and intellectual. That's not counting tacit talent. However, what we also need to understand is that this is also being supported by a variety of funds, some governmental, NSF, NIH, some DOD, some philanthropic. However, one of the problems has been that until quite recently, the viability for neuroscience and technology to be utilized in these types of military agenda has been somewhat obtuse. Now, again, there has been something of a history over the past 50 years. I think a wonderful history of that appears in my colleague John Moreno's book called Mind Wars. And I refer you to that book. And if Jonathan Moreno is not familiar to you, let me recommend him to you wholeheartedly. Wonderful philosopher and ethicist. I've worked with him for years, and he knows this field quite well. But I think the prowess that Dr. Moreno brings to the field is being able to illustrate the historicity of this, as I'd like to illustrate in this slide. Using increasingly more sophisticated tools and technologies, brain science has been able to elucidate more and more about the brain. And there are three letters I'd like you to remember, easy to remember, A, A, and A. That's what the brain sciences do. Allow access to the brain, allow us to assess the brain, and allow us to affect the brain. And if we think about this in somewhat military terms, the availability of reconnaissance methods then allows an increased viability for targeting methods. That's what the brain sciences allow us to do. This slide nicely demonstrates the past 100-year history of the brain sciences, inclusive before it was even called neuroscience. We've gone from early anatomical and surgical investigations of what the brain can do, to then being able to dissect the brain and understand the structure and function a little bit more intimately, to then being able to not only image the living brain, but to access and affect the living brain by utilizing the conjoined use of imaging and a variety of invasive techniques to then be able to both invasively and non-invasively affect that brain. So what we see is that neuroscience had made huge leaps utilizing a whole host of ever more sophisticated technologies, some of them from within the neurosciences and others from beyond. Increasingly, the boundary between neuroscience and engineering has become seamless. That said, what this has now done is put the brain literally at our fingertips, at our fingertips of investigation, parting the proverbial curtains of the vagaries of what the structures and functions of the brain may do, 
but also parting those curtains of capability to allow us to literally go in up to the elbows to be able to assess, affect, manipulate, and control the brain. What that essentially yields is a vast range of capabilities, inclusive of the capability to utilize what we know about brains to intuit an understanding of the biopsychosocial activities of others, inclusive of those who may threaten us with regard to escalation of their volatility towards violence, aggression, warfare, and perhaps to then engage those targets through a whole host of techniques, some more benign than others, to be able to either mitigate that escalation or in some cases prevent it outright through a variety of different approaches. Either way, we can take a look at the capabilities of the brain sciences gaining momentum to do what we have right here, to affect human relations on a variety of scales, try to optimize those relations in some cases, and in others, try to streamline those relations in ways that are commensurate with national security, intelligence, and defense interests. And in so doing, we may also recognize the capability and real probability to increasingly harness the value of neuroscientific tools and technologies to then be able to influence various postures, stances that are affected by individuals' brains through their functions of cognitions, emotions, and behaviors with regard to those things that run within the operational sphere of both politics and the military. That said, that sets the stage for us to then regard neuroscience and technology, what we call neuro s &T, as a viable weapon. Please let me accurately define what a weapon is. In the more conventional sense, a weapon is that type of a thing that might mitigate or alter an, an individual's capability to fight or wage some type of aggression. True. But cracking open Oxford's English Dictionary, we find a much more literal definition. And that definition is ways of contending against another. Now, such contending against another need not be in the conventional sense. In other words, once we target what those others' vulnerabilities are and how those others' viabilities in some way interface with our own, what we view as our survival, our flourishing, our well-being, our enhancement, our enablement, or the execution of what we view as our particular personal agenda or needs desiderata, we can use said weapons to be able to leverage our position with them. That's a fancy way of saying anything that I use to affect you in any way is a weapon. We see a lot of the old 1940s you know, film noir that see the sultry woman in the bar and she's showing some leg and the guy sort of at the end of the bar says, that dame has some gams, that's a weapon. We've also heard the idea of somebody using their sense of humor to disarm someone. They say, that guy has a sense of humor or that woman has a sense of humor, that's a weapon. Are we using that in a destructive sense? No, not necessarily. We're using that in an ameliorative sense so as to be able to alter their behavior in a means of contending against another. So what I want you to do is I want you to hold both of these definitions to mind when considering the viable weaponization of the brain sciences and what that means. So if we take a look at what is capable here, we see that neurosciences can, are, and increasingly will be used as weapons in these contexts. And these contexts then assume two discrete operational windows of opportunity. First are soft weapons. Now what we're doing is we're advancing neuroscience and technology in their conventional silos of operational use within medicine, within the public domain, within the commercial domain, so as to gain economic leverage on global market stages, as well as perhaps engaging them in dual or direct use within intelligence and psychological operations. In the former sense, with regard to economic leverage, here what we see is building up neuroscience and technological market presence through the use of various medical techniques that can then be used to influence, again, global stages in the medical market. We're looking at 175 billion US dollars per year with regard to neuroscience and neurotechnology. That's a lot of influence. We're looking at things like medical tourism, and we're also taking a look at how we can then infiltrate a variety of international markets with neuroscientific tools and products. Who is going to be the big player in this increasingly as we move towards 2025? China. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. As well, the ability to utilize neuroscientific tools and information in ways that allow us to understand more about the capability of not just potential opponents, but virtually anyone, has indeed been an area that has been dealt as neuromarketing. Understanding how brains work to do the things that minds do then allows us to better understand how to affect psychological interactions with various groups of people so as to be able to engage certain brain reactions that affect their bodily behaviors. That's a nice way of saying I can affect minds to affect hearts. 
Yes, the neural marketing community has done a wonderful job in that, but that has not gone beyond the pale of understanding how neuroscience and technology and the information we know about brains and what they do may also be of key value to the intelligence area, as well as psychological operations. Some of the ongoing work we've been doing with the Strategic Multilevel Assessment Group at Pentagon has focused upon this exclusively over the past eight years in a series of white papers, and I'll provide those references to you at the end of this lecture, and certainly they're available to you in the note pack. They're available directly from the Pentagon. You can get them from joint staff. If you don't have the access to that website, I'll provide it at the end. As well, I'll be happy to provide you with each and all of those. Our point of contact there is a gentleman named Sam Rem, and I'll give you his email as well. And what we've shown over the past oh, eight or nine years over our convening the strategic multi-level group, particularly the NeuroCog group, is that indeed the viability of these techniques has grown. If we look at where neuroscience was in 2008 versus what it was in 2014, we see that that capability delta has rendered the neurosciences very viable for their use in intelligence operations. The more we know about the way people think and tick, the more we may be able to develop those techniques and technologies to alter the way they think and tick. Still, existing in the soft weaponology side, because essentially we're not necessarily using the brain sciences directly to affect another individual. We're using this solely with regard to their ripple impact in terms of what they're able to do to an economic market, or what neuroscience information is able to allow us to understand about the way we interact with others. A key example of this latter function exists within a DARPA program called Neural Networks, or Narrative Networks, the program manager there was Bill Casebeer, currently at Lockheed, that specifically used methods of the brain sciences and interaction with a variety of neuroscientific laboratories to develop a deeper and keener understanding of the way brains work, to be able to develop insights to the way people think and how they can be influenced through information management and psychological operations to therefore mitigate volatility to violence and aggression. But now let's turn the page. That's the soft stuff. Neuroscience can also be used as more conventional hard weapons. And here, they fall primarily into the key domains that are best known to us in those areas that work in bioweapons in general. And this is primarily chemicals, biologicals, and devices. Or, as we like to say, drugs, bugs, toxins, and tools. However, increasingly what we're seeing is that our understanding of what the tools are has been obtuse. Early in the morning, you heard about electromagnetic pulsing and the use of a variety of electrosonic and electrophysiological devices that can be used against individuals as well as groups. This is not something that's brand new. However, the level of sophistication, accuracy, and the granularity at which these things can be used and increasingly will be used is expanding ever more rapidly. I hope to show you that in a moment. But as we can see also from the graph, as you see with the technological push, what the philosopher Hans Lenk referred to as a technological imperative, that is, if you can build it, build it. If you build it, use it. What you see is not only an increased viability for dual use of these tools with regard to weaponization, but direct use in a variety of military silos, both here within the United States and increasingly in other countries, some that are not aligned with the United States' interests. And as you can see in the graph, there's a relative verticality as we move forward in time because of the convergence effect that I spoke to you about earlier. So what you're really seeing is that the more things you put into the stew, for example, the faster the stew boils and the more stuff you can soup out of it that is indeed edible, usable as a national security intelligence and defense potential tool, technique, or capability. If we begin to look a little bit more closely as to what this actually entails, we now can parse off neuroscience and neurotechnologies into two discrete domains of viable functions. In other words, I have two basic sets of tools in my toolkits. I have those things that I can use to assess the brain, and they include things like neuroimaging, physiological recording, genomics and genetics, proteomics, and neurocyberinformatics, the use of big data. We've heard that word bantered around here over the past couple of days, and there's a lot of stuff that deals with AI and cyber. But certainly what we need to understand here is this is information. And we can link the information about how people relate on a variety of different media fronts to what it is their brain is doing to prompt said relations and respond to same. And then we can target those in ways that range from the sublime all the way to the direct to be able to then utilize assessments through the neurocyber fusion to understand how people are relating, who they're relating to, and then infiltrate these nodes and networks with regard to narratives that then affect the brain and the bodies in which those brains are housed. And we have interventional techniques that also link cyberlink neurocognitive manipulation, as I've just said, but then move ever more deeply into the biological range. And here's where we really get into newer drugs, newer microbiologicals, and some revision of the extant microbiologicals, viruses, bacteria, and the like, 
organic toxins, some that we have in our current toolkit, some that can be modified through genetic editing, which we'll talk about in a bit later, and the idea of these neurotechnologicals that represents something of a new battlescape frontier. That said, how can we use these in directly operational ways to be able to enhance, change, or modify the battlescape? Essentially, what does it mean to engage battlescape brain? Well, this is what we have. If we first look at the capability of utilizing these in intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, what I offer you is something that our group has been bantering around for the past few years, which is something called NeurInt. NeurInt basically builds upon existing capabilities in human intelligence, signal intelligence, communications intelligence, be able to harness each and all of these in a synergistic way and couple these with an understanding of the way human brains work. It takes the level of interaction and intelligence operations and grounds it to an understanding of brain function and then re-operationalize it to affect brain function, as we said earlier, through either neuro-cyber fusion or by augmenting the intelligence analyst. What we're now doing is we're engaging two essential functions. Number one, that is analyst-based. Now we're optimizing the analyst function through the use of brain-machine interfacing. So now we're able to see how the brain is processing information, and in some cases, use a variety of techniques to modify that, optimize that, enable that, and or enhance that, which creates a leftward shift in the intelligence acquisition curve so as to be able to increase the capability of parsing signal from noise. And on the other side, we're learning more about the way individuals who are the targets of intelligence operate. As a consequence of that, what we can then do is manipulate intelligence in a proactive way. Once again, this is what we call NeurInt. I only have an hour with you, and there's a lot of material. So what I'll be giving you here is essentially drinking out of the fire hose and soaking you with this. If you're interested in a deeper dive, I'll be happy to provide it either during a break. I'll also provide you with a variety of references that allow your reading material to go vertical. The other access here is that we can use a variety of different techniques to gain insight to the way people think and then engage what's known as individual to group and group to individual comparisons and normativity. One of the issues that comes up here over and over again is what represents a prototypic individual from a given culture. However, what we are finding is that within particular culture, cultural groups, and even contexts of social groups, individuals can indeed be prototypic and as a consequence can be used paradigmatically to assess one brain compare with other brains that are prototypic and paradigmatic for that group, and therefore make generalizations about the way certain brains will work of those types of individuals who may have key biological characteristics, social characteristics, and psychological characteristics within that group. Is there a level of abstraction that needs to be engaged here? Yes. Are we actually modeling what that level of abstraction is so we can develop a quasi-calculus to determine what a ratio delta is for what their brains are doing and what they're doing? So is we able to have what's called an extrapolation factor? Indeed, we are. And that's some of the work that I'll provide for you and also some of the work that appears in our white papers. How we're going about doing this is utilizing a whole host of different aspects for recording and being able to assess how brains work. But on the assessment side, that may provide us also with some indices of what targets may be controllable, manipulable, and accessible to allow that individual to be somewhat more divulgent of information. It's a very nice way of saying we can also target the brain as a viability for interrogation. This is a very touchy area. Obviously, some of the recent debate and certainly some of the recent proceedings with regard to psychological interrogation of prisoners has raised the specter of what is ethically viable, what is capable, and what that interface may be. One of the things that our group has been very concerned about that I'm sure will be addressed in panels subsequently this afternoon is the ethics of using these techniques and technologies. And this is one of the areas that remains provocative, if not contentious. Can we engage these areas of the brain sciences, pharmacology, stimulation, integrated assessments with an individual who's then sent back into their particular community with biosensors on board, so as to be able to decrease the net harms that are incurred to any individual, and yet do so in a way that allows maximum extraction of information? So I don't have to harm an individual via interrogation. I don't have to use some form of threat or some actual form of burden or harm, yet I can extract information more effectively and efficiently is that indeed ethically justifiable? One might think as a simple knee-jerk reaction that, in fact, the answer is yes. But here, too, what we're really doing is we're opening up a proverbial can of worms, if not Pandora's box, because there are ethical issues that need to be addressed with regard to the viability of the private space of the brain, what that means about interfacing the brain to engage the mind, and whether or not this does represent a viable space or an inviolable space with regard to international norms. Right now, this is still a relative gray zone, but I 
pose this to you because this is an area that the intelligence community is looking at ever more deeply to be able to harness the brain sciences for not only information acquisition with regard to understanding about the way brains work, to interpretation of narratives and the underlying physiological drives that may compel them and respond to them, but also to be able to actually access brains and affect them so as to be able to extract information more saliently and perhaps more safely. Again, a lot we can do. The question is, what should we do with it? If we then move into the more applicable warfighter space, clearly this gets into the idea of warfighter as well as intelligence operator enablement and optimization. There are discrete categories of what represents functional optimization, performance enablement, and true enhancement. And then at the far end of enhancement, what we then find is radical modification. These are important distinctions to understand and I think to be not only literate about but fluent about because more and more you hear the idea of enhancement being bantered around a variety of different fora. I think there's something too generalist to that and I think there's also a public response that goes along to that. Operationally defining these terms and defining them in terms that have great meaning as well as opening up particular ethical, legal, and social issues is important to do. I'm very, very proud of some of the work done by our group, specifically my colleague, Dr. John Shook, who, when tasked by an Air Force specialty investigational group to be able to define what these things really mean, took a very, very deep dive and looked not only into the literature, but looked prospectively. So as to be able to say, this is what we can do, this is what we have done, and what will we be able to do over the next 60 to 120 calendar months? What represents a functional optimization or a structural engagement? What represents an enablement that's going to be task-specific, contextually specific, and reliant upon training? What represents a true enhancement? And then what represents a radical modification? And in the event, what are also the incumbent obligations and responsibilities that we may have to warfighters and other operators with regard to said modifications? And what doors, potentials, and problems does that open up when they are no longer in these operational silos and we then have what may be a post-optimization, post-enablement, or post-enhancement distress syndrome that may represent a disability that then they need to be cared for. And moreover, what do we do with individuals who have been both modifiably and non-modifiably advanced so as to then make sure that they stay at the cutting edge? In other words, what do we do with individuals who've received these enhancements that may either be extractable or non-extractable after version 1.0 becomes obsolete? Is there some obligation to them to give them version 2.0? 3.0, and if in fact that obligation does not exist, do individuals who then have version 1.0 become literally disabled, or at least disenabled? And what do we do with that? Do we pass that off to the VA? Do we pass that off to civilian organizations? Do we also cloister or silo these individuals to particular jobs that they're only capable of doing once they're no longer in that particular military intelligence or operational sphere? These are real ethical, legal, and social issues that need to be confronted because the realities of what I'm telling you here are not science fiction. They are science fact that are poised for operational engagement within the next 60 calendar months. As well, with regard to what we can do to warfighters, we also recognize we can use a variety of means to optimize not only the way they think, but the way they operate, the way they sense, the way they perceive. Some of the ongoing work, for example, my colleagues at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories are doing are engaging certain forms of prosthetic that change the sensibilities and sensitivities of a variety of our different sensoria. For example, eye, ear, and touch. We recognize that through the use of orthotics, prosthetics, and indwelling and externally dwelling devices, we can modify these sensoria to essentially make an individual have what's called bat ear, dog's nose, bird's eye. So what we can do is we can take the normal individual that exists within what we'll call a Gaussian distribution of normal physiological range of performance, what I can see, what I can hear, what I can smell, and what I can touch. And we'll be able to modify that. So now we may have an individual who is now able to see on a broader spectrum of light, an individual who can see into the infrared or ultraviolet range, or more accurately at a distance. An individual who can hear hypersonically or ultrasonically. An individual who has higher tactile sensibilities and sensitivities. The olfactory system is a little bit more difficult because of the way it's hardwired in the brain, but it too is not impenetrable, although it needs something a more sophisticated implant. The other forms of implants are rather simple. They involve putting something in the eye, running a very thin fiber optic wire into key areas of the brain, and suddenly you have an individual who sees a much broader spectra of light than the normal individual. So what we can actually do is we can not only work with a normal range of enablement and optimization, we can also go beyond that into these radical modifications. And here, what we're seeing is the capability to do that. And although we may have some qualms about doing this, please understand that is not classified technology. 
that's being used in the medical range. And as a consequence of that, this is intellectual property that is broadly distributable. Here, once again, there are discrete programs that are actually dedicated to just this type of thing that are ongoing in China and represent the key focus of the next five-year plan. As well, we can develop a variety of different drugs that can be used in war fighting scenarios. Now, what I want to make sure you understand is that these drugs can not only enhance the war fighter with regard to maximizing their particular capability, but can also be used to maximize war fighting capability by then affecting others. So clearly, I can affect others by either what I'm doing, making me better, or what I do to them, making them, quote, less better, or at very, very least, not wanting to fight. In the main, these are indeed weapons of mass disruption, not destruction. And the reason that I mention this to you is that that absence of mass destruction has in some cases veiled them for closer scrutiny, but the disruptive effect can be huge. So for example, one of the things that we can do is we can use a variety of these new forms of drugs that target specific functions of the nervous system, such things like affiliation, amelioration, attitudes, behaviors, and cognitions, and we can target key individuals. Early this morning, we had General who spoke to all of us, and he gave us a very rousing message and talked to us how specifically we need to engage science and technology. If I were, for example, able to modify the coffee that he drank, the water that he drank this morning, with an undetectable chemical that was delivered at a very, very low range, and he gets up before you and he says, this is all bunk, ladies and gentlemen. You shouldn't be here in this room. I don't believe a word of what I'm going to hear. And my particular concern is, with regard to the United States Army, is we should move in other directions, and we should basically work on potting, flowering plants. You think one of two things. Either he's completely gone wackadoodle and lost his rocker, or I'm going to follow this guy to the end of the earth because he's not only a power-driven leader, he is, in fact, a charismatic leader who I believe in. So the ability to affect a single individual, whether it is a military leader, a political leader, or a diplomat, through the use of modifiable brain functions at very, very low levels of non-detectable drugs that exist in the high nano range, is, in fact, creating a ripple effect by virtue of their followers, either an affiliative effect or a disruptive effect. Moreover, we recognize we can also use a variety of microbiological agents to incur a whole host of morbidities, but not necessarily mortality. And what we may want to do is to utilize these first two in such a way that creates a very, very broad ripple effect to then essentially dissolve the fiduciary between the public and the public health. Let me give you an example, and it's an example that I used in a recent article that I wrote for the Defense News. And I'll give it to you very, very briefly. What I do is I either use a drug in very, very low concentrations that may not necessarily be traceable. And again, this is highly doable. You just have to permeate the edge of a drinking vessel or an atmospheric vessel, get the drug on board. It kind of auto-assembles in situ because of nanopharmacology. Very difficult to trace, and it creates a biological downstream effect. Nothing I'm telling you here is sci-fi. It all exists within the medical range and how we're able to treat a variety of neurological disorders targeting the brain, being able to get in there more specifically, affect certain neural cancers, et cetera. And what we can do with some of these drugs is we can also use these techniques that we're learning on the pharmaceutical side to modify certain bugs. And we spoke earlier about a technique that's become very well known, CRISPR-Cas9, that allows us to literally modify bugs in a variety of different ways. So I now may be able to take a relatively harmless microbiological agent, a bacterium or a virus, do some gene editing and make this thing far more morbidly viable, make it far more virulent, and in some cases even make it far more lethal. But I don't want lethality, at least not necessarily. What I want is high morbidity. I want people to complain. So what do I do? I go to Des Moines. Ladies and gentlemen and people on the screen, I have nothing against Des Moines. I lived there for four years. I go to Des Moines. I infect a couple of sentinel cases in Des Moines. I go to Seattle. I infect a couple of cases there. I go to North Carolina, I go to Wisconsin. What I'm doing is I'm using a dispersion methodology to be able to infect sentinel cases with a highly morbid condition. These individuals complain. Again, this is a central nervous system condition. So they're complaining of whatever the bug may do. It'll produce some cascade of neurological and neuropsychiatric signs and symptoms. And then what I do, the real bug that I use is the internet. I take attribution for that. Yes, I'm a terrorist group. And I have done this by infecting with a highly lethal agent, and the first signs and symptoms of lethality are X, Y, and Z. These people are really sick with this. But then I say, others who are also infected will show subdromal, predromal signs of lethality, and what that will be is anxiety, sleeplessness, agitation. 
What I've now done is I've got every individual who is diagnostically hypochondriacal, and I've got every individual who's the worried well flooding the public health system, banging on the door. The CDC comes back and says, nonsense, that's not real. I come back and say, that's fake news. And as a consequence of doing that, what I do is I create a schism between the polis and the public health system. I fracture the integrity of trust and reliance upon the population and its government. And of course, I'll be able to then incur a ripple effect. And if you want to see what this looks like in, in action, all you need is look back at those days prior to or post 9-11 when individuals were sort of sending white powder through the mail and everything was anthrax. Real story. We had a scare at my institution, and I was at Houston at that time, at my institution, where they literally called in the public safety works, the fire department and EMTs, because someone had spilled equal the sugar all over a set of envelopes and left it in the mailroom. Panic. Panic. Is this viable? Is this capable? Of course it is. Are there other scenarios that individuals could spin? Yes, absolutely. Moreover, you heard earlier about the idea of nanoparticulate matter that can be utilized in a weaponizable way. And here, too, we're looking very, very strongly at what nanoparticulate matter can do to the nervous system. Some ongoing studies with our colleagues in the medical branches of NATO have, in fact, shown that the use of nanoparticulate matter in a scatter arrangement can be used to incur what looks to be broad-scale epidemiological stroke epidemics. So what we're able to do here is infiltrate the brain space with nanoparticulate matter that aggregates in situ, on site in the brain, and does one of two things. Either penetrates from the vascular space, gets in through the bloodstream, gets in through the nose, through the mucosa, or infiltrates the vascular space and clogs it. What is the result? What's called a nanoparticulate stroke or a hemorrhagic diathesis, fancy word, for it's a predisposition to individuals having brain bleeds. Demonstrated? Oh, absolutely. We're able to show animal models of same, and the Italian group has done a fair amount of work demonstrating that nanoparticulate matter can be highly disruptive, not only of brain vascularity, but brain function. You may not necessarily incur a stroke, but you're going to begin to disrupt the network properties of the brain, and as a result, engage something more of a long war's effect through the use of these types of matters, where you now begin to influence the population in increasingly concentric circles of expansion. Moreover, you heard earlier, and I'm not going to beleaguer the point of the idea of neurosensory devices and a whole host of trans and intracranial pulse stimulators. And of course, these can be used for a variety of things with key individuals. Once again, particularly when it comes to trans and intracranial devices, I'm not looking for this to be weapons of mass use. I'm looking to target key individuals who may then be influential to relative aspects of their representative groups. I can affect individuals' brain functions in a variety of different ways, both positively and negatively, by engaging or disengaging nodes and networks of the brain that therefore affect their cognitions, emotions, and ultimately their behaviors. Moreover, by understanding the way the brain works as nodes and networks and not as key sites that are doing any particular thing, I can also utilize various forms of electromagnetic radiation and energy to be able to disrupt brain function. The brain is an electromagnetic organ, and like any other electromagnetic substance, the integrity of those networks is reliant upon the electromagnetic pulses that flow in between them. Utilizing electromagnetic sensory and disruptive devices in this way, with ever greater fidelity and with ever greater granularity, can be used as not only an organ against individuals, but against groups. And in fact, this is some of the work that we've seen that has been conducted previously in what was the Soviet Union, now Russia, and also China is looking very, very deeply into what electromagnetic pulse generation can do to the brain with regard to treating diseases and also incurring certain disease states and in individuals who may then be susceptible, who may be exposed to such pulses. Of course, the dual use viability of that becomes evident. Something my colleague Jamie Canton likes to play with an awful lot is the idea of specialized neural operations. And here, once again, we're talking about the use of either drugs and or devices to modify the integrity of brain function that we realize can also modify individuals' perception of time and space. We talked earlier about how these may be used in interrogation scenarios, and this too may be used against key individuals to be able to modify their perception of time, their perception of what occurred and what did not, memory modification, etc. If we keep pushing the envelope a little more, we need not limit neurological modification, engagement, and weaponology to the human frontier who may recognize also that anything biological can then be weaponized. Here we're talking about primarily is the idea of weaponized non-human animal drones. And clearly, the one that comes to mind is something referred to as the DARPA beetle. 
This is nothing prototypic. This was a research development test evaluation and small scale use enterprise where DARPA was looking to understand and understand how to affect the nervous system of a living organism through the use of integrated biosensors and engaging articulative devices. And what the DARPA beetle, as well as the DARPA fly, demonstrated pretty well is that we can harness the nervous system of an insect, particularly a fairly large insect, such as a beetle of this magnitude, as well as smaller insects the size of a large bee and perhaps a large fly, as we'll see subsequently. And by harnessing into their nervous system through the use of very, very fine scale wiring and the use of optogenetics coupled with an onboard battery pack that is solar sensitive so the battery never, never runs out, and the use of onboard RFID sensors that allow us real scale, both sensing and communication with that simulatory pack, it allows us to engage the nervous system of that organism. So that would be as if I'm saying, I take a particular thing, I strap it onto my bug, I infiltrate that bug's nervous system, and I control the way it moves. By controlling the way it moves, I control the way it goes. I control its wings pattern. I control where it hovers, where it flies, where it articulates. And what I can also do is I can then couple this to a very, very small scale set of either biosensors or cameras. And what I basically have here is a bio drone. I can go one step further on. I can also impregnate that individual, that individual organism, with a very small scale weaponizable delivery mode. In other words, if I'm using a very, very small scale bioweapon, such as a very potent organotoxin, or the delivery of a very small level of microbes that we know can either replicate and infect, or is genetically modified to have a very, very high morbidity effect, I can then utilize this not only as a reconnaissance drone, but also as an infiltrative weaponizable drone that can then deliver some payload to a specifically small and contained group in a very specialized way, or if I use enough of them, an ever-expanding larger group. Now, obviously, the reason that DARPA was looking to do this was primarily to understand how nervous systems work and may be then engaged with a variety of techniques. This has now been commercialized into a group that is called Dragonfly. And although Dragonfly explicitly states that their funding has not come from the Department of Defense, and that their iteration of this type of device and integration of a biological organism is not for weaponizable purposes, I think that the potential dual use is evident for any and all to be able to observe the viability of this type of thing to create, essentially, a biological or cyborg drone. So, what I've hoped to have shown you over the past few minutes is essentially this, that neuroscience and neurotechnology are indeed relatively facile. You can get this stuff right off the shelf, there are dedicated efforts to it, not only here in the United States and among our allies, but internationally. And of course, that there is being conducted by a variety of nations. And in some cases, particularly based upon some do-it-yourself stuff that I'll talk about in a moment, this then obviously gives us a much wider opportunity space of not only nations, but non-state actors. The variety of applications that I hope to have shown you. And I think the caveat here is that a lack of commitment on our part does not necessarily mean a lack of commitment on others. In fact, if we see that this is going to be ethically, legally, socially problematic, it becomes important for us to deal with what those issues and problems are on the one hand, and on the other to address them specifically. Why? Because increasingly neuroscience and neurotechnology is being conducted on the world stage. It's being conducted on the world stage for medical purposes, but the dual usability of brain science and its technologies, as I've hoped to have shown you, is not only evident, it is realizable and operationalizable now, and certainly is on a trajectory towards increased operationalizability over the next five to 10 years. Some of the work that I've done with the ongoing support of Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories has taken a deep dive into the efforts of China into neuroscience and neurotechnology. And we see this both as tactically labile, that is to be executed now for key purposes in medicine, public life, inclusive of public life beyond what may be the public sphere, but also social life, inclusive of political and the military, and things that are more strategically latent. In other words, in five to 10 years, what can be done now to then engage latency on the world stage, both with regard to soft effect and hard effect. Other countries include Russia, and you'll hear more about Russia, not only in the course of this conference yesterday and, and, and today, but also some of the ongoing work of this group that is focused on Russia, and some of our ongoing work is now looking to Russia with regard primarily to the way they're funding a variety of non-state actors, certainly India, Iran, North Korea, and South America. And I think one of the other things that becomes important for us to understand is that these efforts are not necessarily wholly conducted in state-level laboratories, university laboratories, or institutionally. Increasingly, what we're seeing is a rising cadre of do-it-yourself brain science. This is colloquially referred to as neurobiohacking. And indeed, the biohacking community is of significant interest. 
that there's been an ongoing investment and engagement of the Federal Bureau of Investigation with the biohacking community here in the United States so as to ensure that what they're doing is not only technically right, but is also ethical, legally good, and to also ensure that this community does not render itself vulnerable to infiltration from external sources who may have capricious, if not nefarious, interests in infiltrating said communities towards creating products, outcomes, and tools that may be disruptive to the public health, public safety, and national security. But increasingly, the availability of these tools, the availability of this knowledge, renders almost all neuroscience and neurotechnology at least viable for potential do-it-yourself engagement. And increasingly, what we're seeing is venture capital investment in certain areas of do-it-yourself. And sometimes that venture capital is funded by nation states who have defined interest in weaponizing brain science. That said, I think what we need to understand, as I mentioned before, is that what we can do is provocative. What we should do remains at issue. We've seen this as a super speedway. Indeed, there are a lot of players, lots of lanes, many, many vehicles. The pace is fast. The prizes potentially in a variety of fields, both medical as well as economic and certainly within military are big, and there are risks and hazards. The question then becomes, are there race rules that all can participate and play along with or not, and are there race restrictions? Obviously, if we look at some of the ethical, legal, and social issues, they may be parsed into two domains. Those that are focal to the technology, it's new. These are unknown frontiers of science and tech. We don't know everything about the brain. There are, as we say, persistent hard questions. We don't know how the great stuff of cognition, emotions, and behaviors actually arise from the gray stuff of those soupy, sparking neurons. And indeed, given those unknowns, the intersection may then lead to what we call runaway effects or the fact that we're messing with nature in ways that we've not yet anticipated. And as a consequence, things naturally happen, but we've never seen it before, what is referred to as a Vexelblatt effect. And of course, what we need to understand as well is that there are a whole host of ethical legal issues. I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole. We have a panel, hold, the panel that deals with that and will hold those issues forth. But they include things like the inviolability of mind, protection of individuals versus their privacy, what represents mitigation of those behaviors and cognitions that may be harmful versus what may in fact be manipulation of the brain-mind space, what is valid and reliable, usable and admissible, for example, in international courts of law. And there are indeed standards. This is an entire field called neuro law. And the idea of what represents norms in a pluralized global society, what we may view as ethically disruptive, problematic, or in some cases distasteful in other countries and other cultures may not be so. How might we approach this? Well, we were tasked with this a couple of years ago, and we developed something called the Operational Neuroscience and Technology Risk Assessment and Mitigation Paradigm. Since, in fact, it was a speedway, we figured, well, let's do something to get us on the on-ramp. And what this really involves is the need to evaluate neuroscientific capabilities and their limitations, realistically, through a lens of what is capable now, what are the limitations, do those limitations throw down a challenge and opportunity for delimitations, and look within a 10-year time span. What are the parameters of possible use, particularly of interest in this space and national security, intelligence, defense, and warfare operations? What are the benefit, risk, and harm parameters that need to be thrown into any calculus of ethical balance? And then frame these within context of application. This isn't new. Rosinski addressed this some 40 years ago, recognizing that the brain could and probably will be the next battle space. We are now poised precipitously on the reality of that challenge. How do we actually navigate that space? Well, this is a work in progress. Obviously, identifying threats and harms, creating strategies, modeling effectively, not just in a speculative way, but in a preparedness way, that becomes critical. There are indeed contingencies and exigencies that need to be modeled into this calculus. These include the technical rightness of any neuroscientific and technological use in national security, defining that we are using the technologies and techniques in the right ways, and although one may think that's axiomatic, it is not very often. We're using them in particular ways and extracting meanings from them that are not apparent. This happens all the time with neuroimaging. Moreover, situational variables that are germane to national security use, evaluation, revision of existing ethical guidelines, and our group has worked with that to some extent, and then establishing real frameworks that are not only viable nationally, as we said, I think the agenda here is that we don't necessarily want to play a fair fight. And I think that's true with virtually every military operation. Let's face it, some of this stuff may need to have some type of protective parentalism. It may need to be somewhat classified. I don't want to show the other team my playbook on Saturday and expect to win the game on Sunday. But by the same token, there needs to be some level of transparency to engage the public in what this discourse is so that, yes, we can achieve the mission 
but do so in such a way that is morally sound and so as to keep our honor clean. So the question then becomes, what ethics? I don't necessarily have the answer for you. Some of the ongoing work of our group, together with my colleagues Michael Tennyson and John Moreno, have explored what ethical possibilities might be viable for such applications. Civilian ethics? Well, what type? And my colleague, Linda McDonald Glenn, deals an awful lot with science and technology ethics, and she'll be on the panel this afternoon and have a specific lecture dealing with those. The question is, are they enough? Are civilian ethics that deal with science and technology adequate and sufficient? Biomedical ethics. Here, understand, the principal maxim is doing good. But what does the good mean when we're looking at these in national security, intelligence, and defense agenda? Military ethics. Well, what military ethics do we use? Justification for warfare? Just use and fair use in warfare? In which case, we're taking a look at things like proportionality. We're taking a look at things like relativity. We're taking a look at extent of use. And where would we use neuroscientific and neurotechnological capability? In a preventive way, in a responsive way. And if, in fact, we're trying to use these preventively, might perhaps an older Augustinian maxim, that is, jus contra bellum, justification for use to prevent war, open up a broader index of ethical possibilities. And if that's the case, how might these then be leveraged on the world stage? In other words, what might be good for us might not be good somewhere else. And what then do we do with regard to the military-civilian balance, with regard to things like transparency and the individual who may have been a military operator at one point in their life and then come back into civilian life on another point in their life? And moreover, what does this mean for global discourses for those countries that look to pursue neuroscience and technology for economic gain, clearly as a potential soft weapon, but also have infrastructures that allow its relative seamless infusion into the military space? So what I pose to you here is the problem we're faced with. As we're unraveling this potentially Gordian knot of the brain, what we may actually be doing is opening up a provincial can of worms with the way brain science and its techniques and technologies not only can be used, but will be used. And therefore, we need to confront, address, guide, and govern those ways it should be used so as to be able to allow a relatively strong operational viability and understand that, in fact, it could be a weak link in any national security, intelligence, and defense chain of operations. But by saying that, what I also want to communicate to you is the importance of the subsequent panel and any lecture, anyone who's dealing with the ethical, legal, and social issues. Increasingly, we, or as I like to say in my hometown, New York, use, all of yous and me, will deal with this issue as Atlas is dealing with this. Oh yeah, we have to put both arms into it. We're balancing the world on our head. And more and more, what I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, is that neuroscience is indeed being used to provide some of that balance. How our brains work, how our minds work, how we think, emote, and behave increasingly is reliant upon neuroscientific information that is gained from these technologies, not just in terms of its assessment, but also in terms of its interventional and therefore effective capabilities. So what we see is that with neuroscience and neurotechnology, Neuroethics is not a bolt-on. It's not an afterthought. It arises literally from the science, literally from the technology. It is the logos in techne logos, and it is a way of knowing in scientia. If we're going to engage the brain sciences, which we are, we have to take a rational accounting for its use, potential misuse, and those of us who are using it in a variety of theaters, this being one of them. Because with that great capability comes tremendous power. And you know as well as I, with great power comes great responsibility. I like to end lectures like this with a quote from my dad. My dad was an engineer, and one of the things he liked to do was build stuff. And I still like to tinker and build stuff. I, I work on cars and airplanes and motorcycles, and I like doing that. It was a skill that my dad and I used to do when I was a kid. It was sort of a father and son engagement thing. And when I was a little kid, my dad used to teach me about tools. And the way he did it, he was give me a new tool every couple of weeks. And after a while, I got cocky, as kids do. I want you to think of me as brain science, getting cocky as kids do. Still a relatively new science with a new toolkit. I'm getting a new tool every couple of weeks. And I want to grab that new tool and go running off and use it. And I remember my dad putting his hand on my shoulder and go, Jim, slow down. Measure twice. Cut once. Sometimes you can't go back. My dad would have made a hell of a neuroscientist and a great neuroethicist. I think what we need to do is we need to measure twice. What can we really do? What are we really not doing? What are others doing? Before we make particular cuts, cuts in things that we should do, cuts we should not do, 
recognize potential harms of omission and commission, and recognize not only the used technical and scientific capability and possibilities that loom large, but the ethical, legal, and social issues questions that must be addressed. Because what we really need to do is measure twice and cut once, because the future, ladies and gentlemen, truly rests in our hands, just as this does. And my group is very focused upon looking at that particular organ in our hands to be able to make a difference. If you're interested in some of our work, this is some of our ongoing work from the Strategic Multilevel Assessment Group. If you're looking for more information, this is some of the work that my group has put out. And this is the part of the lecture that is the unabashed self-promotional plug. If you're interested in reading more about what we've done, I give you this. Not because I'm going to buy a new Ferrari if you buy it, but because I'm very, very proud of the volume that's being uptaken in a number of different programs that deal with brain science and national security. Because we brought together, in doing this, some of the best international minds in the field, brain science, engineering, philosophy, ethics, and law, who are both civilian and military, to look at this problem through their lens and contribute their voices. I'm proud of this book because it was, I think, something of an editorial feat. And it's still current. We put this book out in late 2014, early 2015. And what we find is that many of the things that we are predicting that would evolve over the next couple of years have evolved. And our view was retrospective, taking a look over the past five to 10 years. And as a consequence, that provides pretty good leverage. And of course, I offer myself as a resource to each and all of you. And if you'd like to get in touch with me, that's where I live. Thank you so very, very much for your attention. I hope I didn't bore you. Question you want to ask? I do. Sir, um, I'm Bob Warburg from the United States Army Special Operations Command. I'm the G9, so I'm, in, I'm working concepts, experimentation, wargaming. So some of this is a readback for possible correction or amplification. And so one of our key findings, sir, from our silent quest, which mirrors the Army's unified quest line of experimentation, we're in a hyper-connected, globally scaled information environment, leave that on the table for a bit, that we're competing in near real time for the physical, cognitive, and moral security and adequate governance of populations. Physical security, are you safe from harm? Cognitive security, does the narrative make sense? And then moral security, is it right within your given value set? We're exploring this, this concept uh, or, of cognitive maneuver and um, in our line of experimentation as a synthesis between cognitive and physical maneuver. I know that we'll talk about that later today. But my real question to you, sir, that you're, that's the setup for the question here is, Sounds like there's a need to perceive strategic indications and warnings in the cognitive space. We have, a, we have a methodology for doing that, of course, during the deterrence era and all of that. We've done, as, as has the Army, a lot of work on Russian new generation warfare, their approach to the battle space of the mind. Specifically, when you see little green men off to the left of that, there's been little gray men. And, and here's the final point which is what you're really talking about, sir, is when do we see the little gray thoughts out there in the environment where the, the various influence activities mm -hmm. have occurred? So have you done some work with, uh, in the various entities that you touch on, on strategic indications and warnings in the cognitive space, sir? Yes and no. I think it's very difficult to be able to be fully strategic with regard to the use of these techniques and technologies. They're far more tactically operable at this point. I think one of the problems you have is how much of a strategically latent or how much of a strategically extrapolative viability these techniques and technologies actually offer. The more proximate you get with regard to certain brain functions and cognitive functions relating those, and then saying that X leads to Y leads to Z, I think the safer you're going to be extrapolating out between particular time points of trying to relate cognitive and or behavioral actions to key brain functions gets to be problematic right now, right now. However, the caveat is something that you've already alluded to. As more information becomes available, in other words, as we utilize that information in key big data initiatives as a force multiplier with regard to the viability of use of brain sciences, both in medicine as well as perhaps in dual use agendas, military being one, what we begin to see is the availability of information, access to that information, and usability of information increases, point one. Point two, as more of the various points create a nexus to each other through said big data approaches, the variety of techniques and technologies and multi-level and multi-type of information, multimodal information, then becomes available in a more cohesive way. This alludes back to the point that I mentioned earlier about integrative scientific convergence. So the question is, at what point will we get true enough fusion to be able to make viable predictions beyond the proximate or near future window? 
My estimation there is we're probably about three to five years off in being able to make those levels of correlation that are strong enough correlations to satisfy, real word, satisfactorily sufficient, to be able to not only make particular predictions, but to utilize those predictions as actionable precepts upon which to then engage. So my feeling is, based upon what I've sensed from this community, is we're looking once again here at about a 48 calendar month realization window based upon, number one, the types and techniques and understandings that we're able to gain from the current toolkit. Number two, the limitations that those toolkits present with regard to their approaches, their methods, and the data that come out of them. Number three, the need to be able to assimilate and synthesize those data into a cogent picture and at the same time maintain key issues of privacy and provenance. And number four, then moving that into an operationalizable way that this can be pulled down in real time so as to make proximate to more distal predictions that are then going to hold to be viable, correlational, and therefore actionable. So we can talk individually a little bit more about what that means. I mean, people are probably clamoring for lunch. But I think this is what you're seeing. And there is indeed discrete agenda that is explicitly and axiomatically moving to use just that type of thing. I think where you've evidenced some of that, again, is narrative networks program coming out of DARPA. I think that things that were derivative from that, some of the IARPA initiatives that were based upon that and are trying to move on some of the initial findings and the initial results are instrumental to that. And some of the work, of course, in SOCOM that has been very, very interested in whether or not we can use various types of data in a predictive way and what the viability and value is of that. Excellent question. I'll My pleasure. So here's the question. Who thinks Dr. G is a real mad scientist? <laughs>